All right, are we, we good here? I think we are. All right, so I brought this stack of tomes with us, and we're going to kind of go through these in somewhat chronological order today, I think, with the idea of picking Richard's brain on the experience of working on a paper medium, because, you know, times have changed a lot, and this was before the internet, before even computers were in use so much for publishing, so yeah. what do you got for us? Well, so where we started, this is Computer and Video Games 1990, I believe. Yeah, I think this is, uh, yeah, this is and, in November uh, this 90. Was, this was the year of cut and paste journalism. Now, in the here and now, you go to a website, you cut and you paste it into your own website. But back then, this was <laughs> something very, very different, which was uh, essentially, we would write our copy, we would print it out on a laser printer, and then it would physically be cut out and pasted onto a big white page. All of the elements on a kind of magazine layout would be uh, literally uh, printed out and cut. Yeah, it's a little onto. hard to see here, right? But you can yeah. kind of... So you can see idea. all of this stuff would have been printed out. It would have been put onto like a kind of big white page. That page would have then be uh, marked up by the art editor. Yes, there was an art editor <laughs> who would um, essentially give you the color values. All of these different color values would be marked up uh, it would be sent to a place we called a color house, uh, who would literally just scan in the page, and then they would color it based on the art editor's instructions. And um, we, <laughs> there were no capture devices at that time, so we would actually take screenshots the old-fashioned way. We would point a camera um, at a screen and yeah. take a photograph. If you look closely on these shots, you can actually see the scan lines. It's just a CRT with a camera pointed yeah. up very carefully We at actually it. moved to capture devices about 1992, and there was actually a big debate about how accurate they were, because it was like a, it was like a digital dump of the screen, yeah. and um, you didn't get the scan lines anymore, and we were kind of pondering about whether we should actually make the move, because it didn't look right. It's kind of like the, the look that's often called like the emulator look, you know, where it's just the raw pixels. But they were doing that in the magazines. Like yeah. when you switched to digital, it actually looked like yeah. pixel art like that. We had this device called a Radius Vasta Ops, which is a really cool name, which uh, if I was going to call Digital Foundry anything today, it would be Vasta Ops, I think. <laughs> but um, I like that. it was a really good, uh, super high-end device. It cost thousands, but the clarity of the images we got back then, it's kind of almost, as John says, emulator level. It, it's kind of like a almost pristine analog to digital sort of uh, copy that we had there. So we were looking at this magazine earlier and laughing at it. This is the classic Mean Machines Christmas special. So, yes. I don't know if you guys can see the hologram here, but uh, it's kind of like little fat Mario on here. It's, so It's pretty great. This I, is I, the I like thing. This. It, you know, how old is this magazine, John? Uh, this is 92, is it? 91, probably, 91. actually. Yeah. yeah, 91. And it's taken until 2018 for, me, uh, for John to actually point out to me that Mario's <laughs> dimensions here are... It's not right. They're not canon. <laughs> it's, it's not really what he should look like. Maybe it's kind of like the wilderness years between Mario 3 and Super Mario World, where yeah. he sort of let himself go a bit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if I was Nintendo now or Miyamoto, I'd consider that an affront. But back at the time, yeah, it was pretty know, it awesome. Worked. Yeah. But So this is interesting. I think uh, in the UK... From what I can tell, your Mean Machines was kind of a big deal. It was a very popular magazine. Yeah, we sold and about um, at peak about 150,000 copies a month. Wow, which is pretty, a, pretty pretty big, big for the print. time. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, were you involved in like Mean Machines essentially coming into existence after working on CV and G? Yeah, because um, Julian Rignall, Jazz Rignall, <laughs> essentially um, came up with Mean Machines. It was a section in computer and video games, and we spun it out into a console-specific magazine, and I was actually kind of there when that happened, but I was working on CVG. But the point is that there was kind of like a shared team. Everybody would work on both titles. And um, yeah, the Meme Machines was kind of defined by those little anime yeah, men, which we, we ripped off from um, uh, Famitsu. It's a little hard to see again from the distance, but you can see one of these little figurines here. 
It's yeah, like they actually little, use like little animated figures for each of the authors, and they would but, dress you guys up. But, <laughs> you know, it's to sort of uh, dispel certain illusions here. I mean, um, there were only a limited amount of those anime men. So what was actually happening was <laughs> free, freelancers were, you know, could be me, could be Julian, could actually probably not Julian, but could be any one <laughs> of the, the staff writers there because there was an actually limited art resource there. So CVG and Me Machines teams at the time were very, very sort of uh, interlocked. We, we were kind of working together. I think I moved to Me Machines full time, maybe issue seven or eight or something. Yeah, uh, and uh, so that was 91. This looking like 92 here. But by the time you get to... 1993, it's Mean Machines Sega, yeah. and this is where we start to see the direct capture. Yeah, I mean, so what which... happened here, the, the cut-and-paste journalism ended. We moved uh, finally to desktop so looks nice. publishing. Look at that. <laughs> Everything was done on Max. <laughs> it, was, um, it, was, it was kind of like a, a huge change for us, but yeah, the transition, when we split Mean Machines into Nintendo and Sega magazines, we moved on to Max. It was a big investment at the time. And we actually, we didn't send anything to the color house anymore. In the basement of our building, we actually had all of the equipment down there. So we would have, um, we would export these Quark Express pages. They would go down to the, to the basement <laughs> on the network. Uh, usually, they, well, sometimes they didn't make it down the network, which is sure, a bit yeah. pain. But, uh, and then we would get back like um, four, four, yeah, CMYK film. So it would all be then sent directly to the printers. So we could do everything in-house at that point. Uh, now, something like, interesting then about this, like that, actually covering this stuff, like what was your relationship with like working with the publishers? And for instance, like today, obviously you have to go through all the PR channels, but from what you've kind of told me, it sounds like things back then were a little different in terms of how the games showed up. And yeah, <laughs> you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> so... To give you an idea of how unofficial things were, to begin with, Nintendo didn't seem to have any kind of PR presence. I remember there was a, a newsletter called Club Nintendo, mm -hmm. and Club Nintendo would get all of the NES carts first, and then when this guy called Mark was finished with them, he'd send them to us. Uh, hey. So there was no actual marketing people. What about the consoles themselves? Did you just go out and buy them yourselves? We, we probably got sent them, but um, uh, actually one of my first memories when I went for my job interview, this would have been in June 1990. Um, this, this was a big moment for me because I was an, an Amiga gamer at the time and uh, Jazz showed me around the office and uh, that was where I first saw the Mega Drive and I uh, saw um, Afterburner 2, Gold oh, Max. Yeah. There was nothing like this on the Amiga at the time. I was Not blown really, away. Yeah. And that was actually why I ended up on computer and video games, because I had zero console knowledge. My last console before that was the Atari VCS Oof. in like the wow. early 80s. So um, yeah, that's why, we, why I moved to, to CVG. But funnily enough, the first review I ever did was before this. It was for a, a kind of like a compilation we did called The Complete Guide to Consoles. Mm -hmm. And the first review I did was Spy vs. Spy on the NES. Wow. Which uh, <laughs> a classic game, but not exactly known for being a console title, I think. No, not at all. Yeah. Now, before we move on, though, one thing we didn't mention was um, so obviously he's taking pictures of CRTs in the early days, right? But digital cameras obviously didn't exist back then. So, yeah. what were you doing what, to actually get these screenshots? Yeah, that's that's an interesting story. We had like uh, this really expensive Minolta camera, really fancy lens on it. We shot onto 120 millimeter film, so we actually had a, quite a big canvas for the transparencies. It's you know, much better quality than the standard sort of 35 right, mil. Right. And um, we, yeah, you, you would just unload the camera, you'd have a spool of film like this, and we would just go over the road to a, a studio, um, and we would just get them developed. You'd get the film back like later that day. Um, it, <laughs> that's just yes, that is so different from today. So you know, looking back, when you when you consider the move to capture, which is instant results, mm -hmm. pristine quality, I don't know why there was any debate at all about the move. It was it, it was a massive time saver. There's also the thing like you can't you can't really take a photograph of a game that's in motion, right? So that's you have right. to hope that there's a good pause mode or like a way to like get a clear shot 
when nothing is moving, and that's not yeah, so easy in that, a lot of games. That is correct, yeah. So, you know, you would have a lot of shots of nothing happening because <laughs> it's the only way you could get a shot with no ghosting. And actually, even when we moved on to capture, the issue there was that you needed to press the capture button at just the right time to get a dynamic shot. And uh, one thing, you know, my love of Sega begins with the fact that they actually had a pause mode where you could pause the game, press A, B, and C, and the pause bu uh, prompt would disappear. That's awesome. And you get a perfect shot of, you know, excellent action. But beyond that, it was literally a case of um, uh, hoping, for the, hoping for a great pause mode, and if not, having really boring shots. So, I mean, you're basically doing all this stuff very independently. When yeah. was the first time you actually started, like, going out to, like, shows or, like, trade shows or visiting publishers in any meaningful way? The, um, there were kind of, there were PR guys for the third parties, uh, like Virgin, I remember. There was, you know, oh, yeah. Doma. They were big. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, there was, yeah, so there were sort of companies that did have PRs and we'd go out and meet them and do various bits and pieces and see games before they came out. Um, but a lot of the time it was, um, you'd be waiting for the import carts to, to turn up. And that, so that's an interesting thing then. We kind of, I guess, post Mean Machines, you moved into, well, this, Sega yeah. Magazine, right? Yeah, we had, um, we had, first of all, we had the official Nintendo Magazine. That's right. Um, and then we kind of realized um, that we could probably do a deal with Sega as well. And they were keen for it because they'd seen how the Nintendo Magazine had worked. And so, yeah, we did the official Sega Magazine. And at that point, I mean, you would get like little um, memory ICs turn up with new games and you oh, would cool. stick, stick the little chips into a, into a PCB, which would go into the Mega Drive. So we saw a number of games like that. And um, yeah, that was quite interesting because those, the little pins on the chips could bend or break Yeah, they really were just sending easily. the Mask chips over. That's crazy. Yeah, the, uh, there was one time where... <laughs> um, Sonic 2 came in, and it was obviously the you know top secret. This was ahead of time. This wasn't an import cart. This was stuff from um, Sega. And, and by the way, looking at the screenshots of stuff like this, you can see where some of those like ROMs that are on the internet of like incomplete versions of Sonic 2 that you've seen around. Like, I mean, it comes from places like this, Probably, I'd imagine, yeah. because there are differences that yeah. you see in those pre-release ROMs. So yeah. that's kind of. But what happened was one of the guys took the game home overnight. <laughs> and uh, came in late the next day, and you know, it was a, it was a nuclear disaster because we'd lost Sonic 2, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we were literally on the point of calling the police when uh, the guy came in with this. Uh, it was me, sorry. <laughs> but you're right. There's you know the the, the kind of enduring t tragedy is that you know every year, two years there would be a massive clean-out. There'd be a skip at the front of the building, and all manner of stuff was thrown in it. And um, we, keep get, you know, for, we keep getting people uh, contacting us saying there was this particular game you previewed in issue five of Me Machines, never came out. Do you still have the code? And it's like, chances are it went in that skip, mate. Sorry. Yeah. Um, there were one or two um, sort of games that, the, the classic case in point, uh, we did a preview of Sonic 1 on Me Machines, uh, which actually wasn't presented to us as little chips. It was a really heavy cart. It was right. obviously like uh, flash bombs in a in a cart. I I know where that cartridge is. It's got content that wasn't in the final game. But the guy who's got it, has got some sort of uh, issue with his dad. He can't get access to his storage. So oh, no. <laughs> there's all manner of little stories and bits and pieces. But the vast majority have unfortunately got thrown out, which is uh, a real shame. For I hope someday you can recover that cart because I would really like to check. I'd that really out. like to see. That it. would be an yeah. interesting thing to present. Just to see what version that is. That's very interesting. <laughs> but yeah, so like looking through some of the Sega Magazine stuff, they did some awesome, like there's this huge feature here on, on Treasure. You guys know Treasure, right? So like, I mean, there's like a look at their office here and like look at all the different games. And it seems like you guys actually had like a liaison yeah. like in Japan at the time that was kind of helping you out. There's one magazine I think changed the landscape of journalism at oh, the time, right. okay. which was Edge. And that's, um, that's which, which is kind of like a double-edged sword because um, on the one hand, there's no doubting the quality of the magazine. It's the only magazine of the year that persists into the current. It's true into the current day, which is you know hugely significant. But at the same time, the emphasis I think shifted from talking about the games to talking about the developers, and it was unprecedented levels of access. 
And everybody wanted to do it because it was the cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Edge kind of cornered the market there, but everybody was kind of trying to do the same thing. And I think at that point, maybe some of the fun started to be drained out of doing games journalism. Yeah, and I think uh, this kind of brings up a point in your career where, um, well, there's Maximum. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with this? Anyone? It's, it was a very niche title. It was essentially an, an attempt to do what Edge were doing, to have that kind of same level of access. And we did have a guy in Japan, but to kind of try and keep the emphasis on games and the way they play. But it was, it was just a, a nightmarish production from start to finish. How many issues did this we have? We did uh, six or seven. I can't so remember. That was seven. Like, this yeah, is the final so this one. is seven issues. The back, of course, is black because it was like, hey, we're done. But the production quality on this is really quite impressive. Yeah, it was, you know, we actually have this discussion now when we do YouTube videos, which is, you know, we want to put 100% effort into every video Yeah, we, we do. But there's kind of like a, an exponential curve of effort versus, actually more like this way, effort versus reward, where, you know, 80% of our effort will probably get 99% of the reward. So that final 20%, you've got to be really quite careful about how you allocate your time. Yeah. Because it's not going to resolve in a, in a massive amount of exactly. extra views. But at the same time, you want to do it because you want to do the best job. So you kind of top out at, you know, 90, 95 on some cases. But the point I always make is that, you know, the users, the, the end user is never going to see the 5% you never did. That's true. So that's kind of, that was the, the object lesson of Maximum, which is, you know, it's to the point where we have these things called clipping paths, where you get in some art from a Capcom game and it's all hand drawn to oh, make yeah. it look good on the page. You've got to take it into Photoshop or Illustrator, it might have been, and actually physically clip out the artwork from the background uh, to get a really good clipping path. So, you know, in this particular issue, there's, um, yeah, a, really there's a couple nice things in here. Street Fighter piece, which was hand drawn art overlaid over hand drawn art. And it, yeah, yeah, you can actually kind of see it here. So it's it a little hard only, to see. This, but it only works because we've got this stupendously insane level of um, fidelity on the clipping path of these, these character models here. But, you know, the art editor who did this would have spent like days. I mean, can you imagine cutting like out physically cutting out around every little piece yeah, of artwork like tap, just tap, to tap. layer it on top of other artwork? That was the level like of this. detail that went into this magazine, which, to be fair, the user is not going to be, you know, aware of. And we're kind of at that point doing it for ourselves. And you kind of um, pushed it a little bit too far. Yeah. So, you know, there were lessons that we learned from that one, which was specifically you know, you've got to rein yourself in at some point and not go insane. And I think there are still areas, particularly in what we do now, where it's really hard to do that because... Yeah, it's it's hard to balance that stuff. Like, so I've been doing that DF Retro stuff for about two years now. And um, I mean, sometimes I'm like crunching to get those done in just two days. And it just, it takes a ton of work. And I kind of do it for myself at right. that point. But it's like... Things. You wonder, it's not, like, it's if not you two days, though, is it? Because you, you then go and yeah. work on Saturday. That's true, exactly. Out, so it's actually a three-day project. And it ends up becoming three-day. And it's really yeah. just about, it's the same kind of thing with this, where it's you really push it hard because you want to do it. And sometimes that extra little bit, you know, it helps make it better. Yeah, but, uh, but you know, a lot of the stuff we were doing in there, we moved into the Saturn mag. Which is, uh, so, so that's interesting. At the very end of, of this magazine here, you say that Maximum will return... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> later that fall and yeah, like look out I'll for I'll tell you what happened there is that essentially uh, we were done with it um, half of the editorial team had moved to the US by that point there were literally two of us left to complete that issue Oof. but um, the the uh, powers that be wanted to bring in a new team to continue to do other things because actually the final issues sold quite well oh, uh, which is okay. a kind of crushing irony. The issue with Maximum was that we always put the game we thought was best on the front cover. And unfortunately, this was a PlayStation dominated era, um, era and we did Virtua Fighter 2, Sega Rally. Uh, we did the Soul Edge arcade machine. So it's okay. all stuff that was really worthy of going on the front cover, but it was stuff that didn't really make commercial sense. It didn't move the needle in terms so, of interest. Yeah, so. again, this was something which key lesson that we learned going going, going so forward. from maximum then i think you went into the sega yes. saturn magazine here 
And these were uh, these are quite nice, and most of them seem to have come bundled with demo discs, which is great um, as well. Not most of them; it'd be like every three months. Every three months. The issue was um, Sega didn't have the content. To put oh right, on. yeah, that's uh, the issue. On, on, on our monthly. <laughs> that was the problem. So we ended up doing stuff like remember we put um, issue one of uh, sorry disc one of Panzer Dragoon Saga yeah. uh, on, which you know is awesome. Yeah, that was still kind of an unprecedented <coughs> thing. Where it's like the whole first disc on the magazine. You know, if you like it, then you go out and buy the game. But since they only printed what, like five thousand copies, three thousand, three thousand in Europe, you know, didn't really work out. <laughs> yeah, there were there were forty thousand disc ones from our magazine, so, <laughs> but a deficit of thirty-seven thousand on the other three, which, which is why I have to pay so much for it at that point. But yeah, you can see the the, the design is a lot more simplified. And I think this is the point. Um, sometime in the late era of Sega Sega Magazine, is that that's when you made your first trips over to Japan? Is that right? Yeah, for the new Challenge Conference. Uh, for there were two new Challenge conferences for introducing the Dreamcast. Oh right. And the second one was kind of more software orientated. They actually had stuff to show there. Uh, and we actually, I dimly recall, meeting the guy, the hardware engineer for the Dreamcast, which was a, which at the time was a thrill. That's really cool. Um, but again, this, this is this is the kind of grand irony when you've been doing this for as long as I have. There's stuff that I've done that John knows more about than I do. <laughs> it, you know, the classic one being, uh, so that time you met the president of Sega. Oh, yeah. I didn't meet the president of Sega. That never happened. And then it was in... But, <laughs> but I've got a picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, okay. I, right, yeah, now I know it was a round table. It, I was there, but it wasn't like a one-on-one -on -one thing. But it was... I. I haven't thought about it. But you years. guys had a pretty close relationship with Sega, which was kind of seems like the first time in your magazine history where you were really kind of working a little bit more. Um, with... you'd, you'd say that, but um, we still did a lot of import stuff, which they weren't so keen on. And um, the other thing which uh, uh, didn't really work was, um, well, again, all of the Japanese stuff was all sorted out by Sega of Japan. It wasn't really, really a, a collaboration with Europe. And... Um, there was a there was a, a shift. I mean, we made this ma magazine specifically for the Sega fans, and Sega obviously were getting caned by Sony at that point because Sony were appealing to an entirely different audience. So this isn't yeah. really what they wanted their official magazine to be doing. Uh, they wanted to be, you know, cool like the PlayStation guys, mm. and that wasn't really our audience. And that you know, this we we just didn't go down that route at all. And we tried to with the, when the Dreamcast was coming along, there was like a pitching process. Everybody sort of um, uh, went so to Sega. This is late days Sega Saturn. Yeah, amazing. this would be like 90, I don't know, 99, I guess. And was this still with uh, EMAP? Yeah, uh -huh. all of this. This is all like of a decade was... of EMAP, which is where, in retrospect, you know, it's a long time of my life. I, I spent there doing various console magazines. Um, but it was kind of indicative, really, that things were changing. And um, the official Dreamcast magazine, the winning pitch was a company called Dennis Publishing. Okay. They had like a front cover by um, Rankin, you know, this massively uh, famous photographer. Oh, man. And, and that was kind of the direction where Sega was thinking, wow, yeah, we can take the fight to Sony here. So Dennis uh, actually got the contract for that. And... You know, within a, a 12 months, it was it was like a fan-driven Sega magazine again. A really yeah. good one, I, I should say. But that was, you know, kind of where things moved so on. So you, you obviously left Sega behind. And yeah. some might view this as, uh, you know... Oh, there was a huge... Being uh, a little bit of a betrayal. But then was, you did yeah. um, PlayStation World. And this is uh, interesting because I think this kind of almost ties into where we are today in a weird way. Yeah, but. so we moved on to um, to work on PlayStation World, and um, it was an interesting situation because it was right at the tail end of the PlayStation 1 era. And obviously the PlayStation 1 was huge, you know, massively successful. We were facing this difficult transition period where PlayStation 2 was coming along, yep. and we had... Uh, we, we would have had the import units from day and one. And that, that's actually one of the things I love about this. So this is like a PlayStation magazine, but like one of the first things here at the beginning, the editor's notes, right from Richard, he's pretty much saying, oh yeah, the PlayStation 2, it's good, but not that good. So what's, got, what's gone wrong? It's supposed to be much better. And uh, I was just surprised to see how, how, how 
harsh you were on the system in an official well, magazine, which is kind of cool, actually. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> but I think it, it. I think it reflects. <laughs> I think it reflects the fact that the well, a the games were terrible. Let's let's. Oh be no no no! Ridge Racer, Ridge Racer Five is great. Ridge Racer, yeah, Ridge Racer Fine, but we you know we were looking at stuff like the Gran Turismo Two Thousand demo. Ugh. Which was essentially an upraised that was great, PS1 yeah. thing, and then you know, Phantom Vision. I kind of had a soft spot for that game, but it wasn't indicative of the quality to come, was it? No, no, um, no, no. So yeah, there was a um, the, that kind of. Some I, nice I went, shots that, in here, though. <laughs> that was my final trip to Tokyo, which was the um, uh, TGS. So yeah, what do you remember about that experience at the time? Uh, driving a motion type S. Oh, uh, the yeah. bouncer, those games where you, you, where they were really impressive visual. Does titles. anybody remember driving a motion type S? Anyone? Yeah. Not even one person. Wow. Oh, right. Okay, a couple. Let's the bouncer. So driving a motion was a Square Soft game, a driving game by Square, like the RPG company. And the, yeah. one of the first things they show is this driving game, and it's not very good, but it was like uh, it looked good. It looked all right. Yeah. The bouncer looked good, but yeah. that's about it. <laughs> yeah, so there wasn't actually that much to see on PS2 at the time, and it was a letdown. But when you sort of retrospectively consider it was probably one of the greatest consoles ever. Yeah, it turned out amazing. It turned out there was just some phenomenal stuff on there by the end of the, of the generation. But you didn't see any of that at that point. And you can compare and contrast with Super Nintendo. <laughs> you know, you had F-Zero mm -hmm. and Super Mario World day one. Which were great. Which, you know, and... This was like, this is what a console launch should be. Yep. Uh, I guess it kind of speaks to the fact that we'd kind of moved to a new era where games were becoming a lot more complex to make. Yeah, and having something for launch It took time launch for people difficult. to, you know, to move from 2D to 3D, even from PS1 3D to PS2 3D, which was a proper generational leap. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So. And I think uh, from here... Um, you moved on more to like DVD production, is that right? Yeah, it's kind of How like did that get started. Almost, well, the company that we were doing this magazine with had this huge DVD production facility in Germany. They were a German company, and they spent like half a million euros uh, building this studio. Oof. And um, their DVDs were really good. And the, the the point is that you could actually get like you couldn't have playable demos, but you could actually have footage that actually looked like the console was running on your TV. And so from there, the, the, the kind of focus shifted to making those discs in the UK and doing it in a more cost efficient manner. I think the thing that the DVD authoring tool was 17K oh, and wow. the, the capturing <laughs> devices in total were about 15K. But even so, that's a bit less than half a million euros. So it's a win. That's crazy. Yeah, but um, that was basically where we tried to compete with the official magazine by having a disc on the front, even if it wasn't playable. playable. And uh, yeah, you were over mine the other day and you were looking at all of these mountains of, of discs and you were thinking, maybe there's some preview code here that yeah, actually shows that's stuff. That's the thing is, it's like he actually has a whole crate full of these <laughs> old discs. And so I'm going to raid that and see if we can find something good to use on the show. Yeah. I mean, we actually did get quite a lot of pre-release code that would have been very, very different to the final games there. So. But you did some cool stuff with the DVDs, like the uh, yeah. Knights of the Old Republic 2 one a little bit later on the Xbox yeah, side. Yeah, this was where, after magazines, we were just doing DVDs, and we did one with Prima for Knights of the Old Republic. It was like a strategy guide on a DVD, but we had like access to the... The voiceover guy who did HK47, he was like the cool. narrator on the disc. And we got him to do some like little voiceover cuts and there was like a DVD Easter egg we put on there. It took about 10 years for people to find. Oh, that's great. And, uh, you know, little, little quotes that he came up with to just sort of embellish that disc a little. Rude alert, rude alert. An electrical fire has knocked out my voice recognition unicycle. Many Wurlitzers are missing from my database. Abandon shop. This is not a daffodil. Repeat, this is not a daffodil. But um, doing that DVD stuff and uh, it all sort of tapped into an interest I had, which was getting the best quality outputs from mm -hmm. the from, from the machines. And that kind of led on to what we do today, really. Well, when was the first time you set, actually thought of the words Digital Foundry then? Um, it would have been in end of 2003. 
Uh, but at wow. that point, it, so that's the beginning. There, there was, yeah, I mean, we didn't really start doing Eurogamer articles no, no, no. until 2007. So it was like a three-year period where we just did bits and pieces like DVDs and, and whatnot. And um, thinking about it, we did do a sampler disc which we would send out to prospective clients which showed them some of the DVD work we've done. So I might, I mean, that would be about eight gigs. So maybe I'll stick that on the Patreon. People can download and take a look at yeah, it. That would be but cool. there was some interesting stuff there. I mean, we did stuff like, um, uh, did something for God of War, The Getaway, Black oh, yeah, Monday. I remember that. Yeah, lots of interesting little projects that we did there. Uh, but, you know, it was only really when we started doing the Eurogamer articles that Digital Foundry became what it, anything like what it is today. That's right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, I think we're probably coming up on the point for questions here. Okay. It's, been, uh, it's been some time here, but we could probably go on for hours with the stories he has to tell. But hopefully that's kind of a good rundown of just a very general history of, well, your career and kind of the experience of working on these magazines back in yeah. the day. Is there it, any other, like, last things that kind of interesting um, to mention here? Just that things these days much more immediate. We had, like, a month to do a magazine. In the early days of Me Machines, we had a, a, <laughs> um, a Street Fighter 2 arcade machine. We'd play Street Fighter 2 for a week. We wouldn't do any work. <laughs> any work. And when Super Mario Kart came along, no work for like a week, maybe even two weeks. And then you'd cram everything into that last two weeks. <laughs> Super Tennis, do you remember Super Tennis? Yes, on the, yes, yeah, yes. that was another game which you know just dominated. And you guys had like import systems before they yeah, were here, right? Uh -huh, yeah, I remember um, when, Su when, when the Super Nintendo arrived, um, there was a massive crowd watching um, Super Mario World. Everyone gathered around to see it. Oh, and, yeah. uh, but funnily enough, when we put in F-Zero, everyone just disappeared. Uh, which was kind of curious, except the guy who uh, brought the console down, the guy who, the, the import guy, basically, who, you know, he, he looked at that and thought, I'm going to make some serious money here. <laughs> and, and he was probably right, yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's kind of tons of little anecdotes like that, but things were just very, very different. And these days, I think people are just um, much better informed. Yeah. We knew nothing, I mean, you know, these days, you get a two-year run-up to a, a game coming out, mm -hmm. and you have mm -hmm. you know numerous developer interviews. You have a um, uh, huge amount of media. Uh, we would just get a finished cart turning up in the mail. Yeah, and that's kind of interesting because it kind of changes the review landscape if you think about it. Like, there is no hype or very little leading up. You're not talking to the publisher. It's just like the game shows up. Maybe you don't even know what it is, and you just play it and review it for what, yeah. what you find. It's so I think in terms of the Me Machine reviews, um, specifically, pretty good track record there in terms of the scoring and the marking and whatnot. But what I find fascinating when I watch John's work on DF Retro is he knows a lot more about those games <laughs> than I did, and I was there right <laughs> at the very beginning. <laughs> because, you know, there's, there's, over the years, there's an accumulation of knowledge yeah. At the time, we just had like a, a jiffy bag with a cartridge in it. <laughs> and so, you know, and a lot of the time, you know, even the stories behind the games would just be wrong or, or maybe the reviewer was so bored, he'd just make up his own story <laughs> uh, because there was literally a dearth of information there. Yeah. So, yeah, it, very different times and we're kind of spoiled, I think, in terms of... Uh, what well, we have today, yeah. The media, screenshots, access to developers. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that does have, I, I agree with you, I think it does have a cumulative influence on the way a game is perceived. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite the same as just a game turning up out of the blue where you know nothing about it. You're going in completely unspoiled. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's very it, different. I actually had that experience. I mean, Onrush is here. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I hadn't, uh, for various reasons, I hadn't checked out any of the media or the screenshots. I think I, maybe I saw the very first trailer. But this was this was like a revelation. I loved the look of that game. It was like, great. Yeah, and it was it was kind of reminded me of the fact that that you know back in the day we would go in completely unspoiled on a game mm -hmm. we'd know nothing about it, and it you know there were some genuine surprises there. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, that's that's kind of like the big takeaway. I think that's the big difference now in games coverage. There there's no influence. There there was no influence really on on your perception. Yeah, yeah there'd be certain titles like you know. Strider on the Mega Drive, you know, that was coming. You knew it was going to be awesome because you'd seen the pictures in Famitsu. Or, you know, Sega with Sonic. 
yeah. more, Nintendo with Mario. Yeah, I mean, there was the beginning was big of the beginning of there. hype cycles yeah, yeah, at that yeah. point. Yeah, but even Sonic, you know, we didn't. We saw that probably before the hype began to kick in. It's cool. So yeah, it was a, a, an aspect of the thing. It's just completely different now. Cool. All right. Well, um, I think we should take some questions. We have some time for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. If anybody wants to ask anything, just come on up to the mic and uh, go for it. Um, sorry to bring the tone down a bit, but what do you think of the death, uh, it seems, of the printed media? And what do you think we're losing because of that? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, I'd love to say that I have an Edge subscription and you know I still buy uh, magazines, but I, I don't. I just think that the, you know, the immediacy of the... Uh, of, of the internet is an evolution in probably in the right direction. The thing that from my perspective, which I kind of think is a bit sad, is um, <coughs> there was always a, a relationship, I mean, in terms of how we actually survived making magazines. We got income from you guys buying magazines and we got income from advertisers. There is no income as such now from, uh, from, from the, the readers. Right. It's all advertising. And so that has had uh, a skew, uh, which which may not be entirely healthy. And this is kind of why we, it's why we set up the Patreon for Digital Foundry to kind of gauge just how many people would be interested to actually go back to this kind of arrangement where we actually get revenue from uh, from users as well as advertisers. So that's been quite heartening in in, in some respects. It has been really useful for us. But yeah, I really wish I could say that I supported the printed media because it, you know, I was in it for like yeah, 30 <laughs> years, <laughs> more than that even. But you know, I think just in terms of the way we consume, you know, consume information these days, the internet is just a, a yeah, more streamlined. I, could, I think with the magazines, I mean, that was the only way to know what was going on, right? And people, yeah. so naturally, so if you wanted to know what was happening, you go there. But now it's more just like a a fun little thing to read a magazine in a way, because you can get all of that information faster directly on the internet. So yeah, I think um, printed media, it's got to be something you'd want to collect and keep. Yeah, like a really nice presentation, like yeah. thick pages, great color and graphics. And if you really do a nice printed, like you've seen a lot of books related to games lately. There's been on you know Kickstarters and a lot of those coming out, like the Mega Drive collected works. Like you look through those books and they're just gorgeous. Like just having those is awesome. So I think print kind of lives on in that sense these days, rather than the print magazine. I'm just trying to envisage a digital foundry magazine. I don't think it will work. But mm. uh, <laughs> that would be interesting. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. So hey. um, regarding the changes in games media, it's been quite clear the examples you've given how it's altered from print to now digital and such. But how has the skill set evolved and changed? Hey from magazine to now online personalities and YouTubers and so on? Yeah, that's a really good question because I think it's actually harder than ever to do what we do. So if you consider the skill set that we have that we need to do to do Digital Foundry, we need to be able to write, we need to be able to edit, mm -hmm. we need to be able to present in a vaguely competent manner. <laughs> Um, we need to be able to do decent voiceovers. We need to be on top of the latest technology to get the, you know, um, to get the best results. You have to be like a jack of, well, not a jack of all trades, a master of all trades. And that's, almost. that's actually an interesting thing. And a lot of people were surprised to learn, like, we do everything ourselves. So, like, each of our own videos, yeah. like, you know, we do them from start to finish, every aspect of it ourselves. Which is why they all kind of have a slightly different flavor, I think, because yeah. we each kind of develop their own house style, so to speak. And it's, I think that it kind of adds to the charm a little bit. Like, it's interesting to have, like, each of us, it almost brings back that, like, personality thing a little bit, where yeah. it's like, we each have our own style, just like they had, like, their own writing styles and, like, the little animated, well, not animated, but static images and the cartoons. But, you know, even if you want to get in ahead just as a writer, now, you know, if you want to be a writer, you've got to be phenomenally good. You know, Christian Donlan Christian is yeah. the gold standard in, you know, he's a guy who can be a writer and a writer only because he's really good. nobody can touch the quality of his, <laughs> of his writing. However, you know, it's, it's even if you want to be a writer these days, you kind of need to be able to set up a website. Yeah. If, you, if you're not 
a freelance for another site. The only way you're going to get noticed is to have a site. YouTube, I guess, is a touch easier in that regard because the platform is there for you and, That's right. and the tools are there for you. But, you know, writers ain't got it easy these days. And yeah, so, even just for any YouTubers that's doing stuff with like filmed footage, like setting up all the camera stuff, getting the mics, the lighting, like that all takes uh, some effort to get right yeah. to make it look decent. We actually and, started off, we had an editor guy who worked for us remotely at the beginning of Digital Foundry. The issue that we had was that he wasn't fully au fait with the content. So we were actually spending more time marking up scripts with, right, okay, put in a clip of Gran yeah. Turismo here. It was actually it didn't work. faster to put the clip of Gran Turismo in ourselves yep. rather than telling somebody to do it. So, you, you know, in an ideal world, I'd love to have somebody next to me who just edits all of my videos, but it's just not viable financially or or any any yeah it still takes too much hands-on to make it work yeah definitely <laughs> cool right, thank thanks you. thanks right, um do you remember rise of the robots <laughs> oh yeah. yeah yeah i i do i remember uh, i remember that one because it was so bad yeah, it but it, had, hyped, it, had, it looked gorgeous so it had a yeah. massive media campaign it's a bit like how um was it No Man's Sky was, how oh, yeah. everyone's, it's such a successful uh, media campaign and it right. just worked, turned out to be garbage. And <laughs> the, the games industry actually changed how they test, how they develop their games from that. Did the journalism um, industry change anything based on that? I think there have been a number of what you might call teaching moments. Um, Driver 3 was another one where oh, it, was, yes. it was kind of like editorial dominated by a marketing campaign and behind, uh, allegedly behind closed door deals, that sort of thing. I'm not against behind the closed doors deals because, you know, if you want to get a story that's, you know, original and distinct, you have to work with the PRs, but you've got to be able to know that the quality of the product is there. And it wasn't in that case. And it wasn't in the case of the Rise of the Robots. Uh, funny story about Rise of the Robots. They were pitching it to various publishers, the sequel. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually, uh, one of the publishers said to me, um, Let's go, can you come down with me to the studio to see whether the sequel's any good or not? <laughs> and that was, you know, that was kind of interesting. And I did actually go down there. And it was, you know, it was, it was an improvement, I think. But... Yeah, Rise to Resurrection. The problem was at that point that the Japanese just did fighting games better than anybody. You know, Street yeah. Fighter, uh, whatnot. But I mean, even by Western fighting game standards, I mean, Rise of the Robots was it was bad. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that it had there was the CGI graphics at the time. Just, just showing still shots of it, people were like, whoa, that looks amazing. And it did, but it didn't move amazing. It didn't yeah. play well at all. Yeah, I think there was definitely, that was one of those teaching moments where the industry kind of sort of thought, whoa, this isn't good. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. It's cool, thanks. Oh, yeah. um, firstly, I just wanted to say uh, I really appreciate Digital Foundry's oh, dedication appreciate to it. being very thorough. Um, my question is kind of about the audience of games media and how it's kind of changed. Mm. Uh, given that Quite a lot of kids growing up now, uh, like right now, uh, sort of getting their information from mostly YouTube and sort of more in kind of an entertainment format. I was kind of curious what your perspective would be on, say, games media in another 20 years when these people have grown up. Um, that's a really interesting question, and that's kind of why we do YouTube and why Eurogamer does YouTube. If you look at, you know, on the face of it, the uh, YouTube gaming audience kind of skews young, uh, mm -hmm. but at some point these guys are going to grow up and they're going to want something different than, you know, people shouting and screaming at a yeah. horror game or whatever. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or maybe not, who knows. But um, uh, that's kind of why we're doing it and we're kind of hoping that we can make a difference there. But at the same time, you know, it is a case of kind of figuring out a very different audience, which is something we found really difficult early on. Mm -hmm. 20 years, who knows? I have absolutely no idea. I couldn't have predicted where 20 we're at years now. ago where we're at now. Uh, that's for sure. But it, this is the kind of thing that I found interesting about doing YouTube stuff is that you, there was actually a, a transferable skill set going from magazines to the web. You know, you could write. Somebody else 
sorted out layout and whatnot for you. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a case of being able to write. I kind of embraced the challenge of doing YouTube uh, because it was something new that I, I had no real knowledge or experience about whatsoever. And I really wanted to try it and to see what we could do there. It worked uh, out pretty well. Uh, well, the, what I really enjoy about it is that I'm always learning about it. And um, John in particular has been at the forefront of pushing quality and production values. And I learn a huge amount from John, which I find hugely satisfying myself and being able to, to you know, raise my standards that way. So, but in terms of where things are going to be 20 years from now, I don't know, brain implants? Yeah, sort of little retina scanners that beam video directly onto your eyes. Who knows? It's kind of scary in actual fact. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Hi there. Um, I've got two questions, if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, so first one, I talked about taking screenshots back in the day and how difficult it was. Um, I used to be a Game Boy coder and make Game Boy games. So taking screenshots on Game Boy, how was that done? Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, that's There's some in there, actually. Yeah. Initially, there were attempts to photograph the screen, and uh, yeah, it, it went badly. Uh, secondly, there was, I believe it, there was a there was a Game Boy device that we had. I think it was a standalone device that you could actually capture from, or more specifically, you could it would it would put this put the output onto a CRT and you would photograph the screen. Have you got an example there? I was looking for that, like. Um... Here's, well, actually, what is, how would you have gotten this here? Like, here's a Game Boy shot. That would it's have not been, a photograph. That would have been ripped off from Famitsu. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, th I think yeah, you hear that a lot, back. It was, yeah, we had, there was a CRT-based yeah. unit where you, which, which plugged it's in. The, which, the wide which, boy. Which, yeah, it kind of worked pretty well, I think. I actually saw, I, you can keep a... Uh, Explaining because I swear I did actually see a good example of a photograph yeah. of Game Boy in here. Now that you mention it, and yeah, it's quite interesting looking. Oh, here it is. If you can actually come up and take a look. So these, I think, are actual photographs yeah, from a Game Boy when, screen. Yeah, you can and see it's, just, it's not working out, is it? No. So yeah, we did actually have a specific device, and it actually persists through to the current day where uh, you get like um, for 3DS, they have like an, uh, a specific dev kit. Yeah. What's your second question? My second question is, um, obviously, Me Machines uh, split into two magazines, yeah. Nintendo and Sega. Um, personally, I wasn't a fan of Split. I enjoyed them being in one magazine, covering both pl platforms. Yeah. Um, can you talk about this, this it decision? It was entirely a business decision, uh, because we had the official Nintendo license. And it kind of made sense, rather than to, CVG would take over the multi-format area, and then we'd split Me Machines into... Uh, me Machine Sega, and it was originally going to be Me Machine's official Nintendo, but they just dumped the the Me Machine. It wasn't going to work out. So um, yeah, that's kind. Of, it was in, it, you know I kind of wish it was done on purely editorial terms, but it wasn't. It was kind of cynical. I, I agree entirely. It wasn't the same afterwards. I got to uh, say though, real quick, this is probably what Nintendo doesn't love. I mean, like sections like the Mean Yob, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, the mean job was great because people <laughs> literally wrote in to be insulted. Can, 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 can you imagine doing that on, on YouTube these days or on, on a website? The, the comments would be a dumpster fire. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, we, it, we literally yeah. had, uh, I think there was a section, this was all Julian, by the way, all, all, uh, where uh, he asked for photographs. Yeah, here we go. Ins oh, yeah. <laughs> Insult corner. <laughs> <laughs> where people would send in pho photographs of, them of themselves. Somebody sent in a picture of himself mooning, and the caption reads, uh, Daniel Baker of Tunbridge, Kent, sent us a picture of the most attractive part of his body. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, yeah. Oh, my you, goodness. I, I kind of, if only we could do that today. I mean, uh, you know, I don't think the audience would appreciate it. No, I don't it. think people would no. love that too much. <laughs> But, you know, different, a different era at that point. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank nice, you very much. Nice point nice as well. Yeah, that's nice. That's, uh, awesome. that's cool. <laughs> okay. I think that'll do it. Yes, that's it. So um, that's all the time we have. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much to John and Richard.